I, w- I was ex- expecting to be jailed this week, but uh, uh, my lawyers really put up a great fight. Uh, but I have no doubt that it's a question of time, whether it's on Monday or some other day or next week. I'm convinced uh, they're going to put me in jail because every day I have more cases registered against me. Now, I'm, I'm, I think I've broken a world record that I have now 180 cases and, and, um, and increasing by the day. And unfortunately, uh, there's right now, we are, we are facing law of the jungle. This is unprecedented. The, not just that there are 180 cases against me, but uh, most of my senior leadership is in jail. The only way they can come out is if they renounce that they're part of my party. That's the only way they come out. And uh, almost 10,000 workers of mine are in jail right now, going through the worst sort of situation. Uh, people who, you know, who are my ticket holders, who have given tickets to contest the elections, they are being forced to, to, uh, to leave my party. Otherwise, they get their houses are broken in. I mean, this is all uh, common knowledge has been going on for over a month. Their houses get broken in, their families are, if they, and they are all in hiding. So their uh, relatives are picked up. Young boys have been picked up. Uh, uh, their women. Uh, so it's, uh, we are facing the worst sort of uh, persecution. Uh, it's never been done, this sort of thing has never been done in Pakistan to political workers. So uh, it's a matter of time, uh, you know, I, I expect maybe Monday, maybe a uh, few days later, but I don't see being out of jail for long. Well, definitely our ex-army chief, he engineered the whole thing. Uh, you know, he used the intelligence agencies to break my party members and also um, our allies. So it was a coalition government. And this is at a time when our government economically was performing the best any government has performed in the past 17 years. And this is despite two years of COVID-19. And when our government was considered internationally to be the top three governments that coped the best with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, so he engineered the whole thing to get an extension. And he then um, uh, joined hands with the current prime minister who was facing corruption cases. He was under trial at the time and they engineered this thing. And where did the US ca- come in? They fed the US uh, this, this bit that I was anti-American. I'm talking about the army chief. He actually had a lobbyist who uh, who was paid by my government without my knowledge, who was lobbying in the U.S. to say how anti-American Imran Khan was and how pro-American the army chief was. So, yes, there was the U.S. Uh, interference came in when their undersecretary of state spoke to Ambassador 6th March uh, 22, uh, and uh, the um, ambassador then sends me the cipher, which says that uh, ambassador s- sends me the cipher, which says that unless I, the prime minister Imran Khan, is removed in a vote of no confidence, there would be consequences for Pakistan. And then the vote of no confidence uh, was tabled the next day. A- and then within weeks, my government left. But we now realize that it was engineered by our army chief rather than engineered from Washington. But that's what we think. Well, look, let let me first uh, clarify what my position on foreign policy is. Look, Pakistan's foreign policy must be for the people of Pakistan. And why? Because 100 million Pakistanis are vulnerable. 50 million below the poverty line and 50 million just above it. So when I came to power, I specifically spoke about how we were going to try and lift our people out of poverty. Now in doing so, you have to have a foreign policy that is basically non-aligned, like India. Now India, for instance, they trade with China, they bought Russian oil at discounted price, yet they are 
partners with the U.S., uh, one of the most strategic partnerships they have in the Quad with the U.S. Because India, their governments are concerned about the vast number of poor people in India, the level of poverty. Same as the case with Pakistan. So my idea was not to be anti any government. My idea was that I should, my concern, the people elected me to help them get out of poverty. Now, we were involved in two uh, uh, conflicts. We joined the US uh, jihad, the Afghan jihad against the Soviets in the 80s. And then in, after 9-11, we again joined the US uh, war on terror. Both these conflicts took a heavy toll on Pakistan. The 80s one left 5 million refugees in Pakistan, Kleshnikovs, drugs flowing in, militant groups. And we suffered from all that, the consequences. Then after 9-11, we joined the U.S. war on terror. 80,000 Pakistanis died. They were killed in that war. And then over $100 billion were lost to the economy. So if my concern are the 100 million vulnerable people of Pakistan, then the best way is to stay out of conflicts. Be partners in peace. We played our part in trying to get the Taliban and the U.S. on across the table. And we were responsible. Pakistan, my government was responsible in the Doha talks. But to be part of any conflicts, I think we just cannot afford it. So more like the Indian foreign policy. I think the whole Afghan war was a mistake. You know, if you know the history of Afghanistan, they do not accept foreign invaders. Whether it was a superpower, Britain in the 19th century, or the Soviets in the 20th century, or the US going into Afghanistan. If, they, if the target was Osama bin Laden, then after Osama bin Laden was taken out, they should have left. Or if it was, uh, I never understood the aims of the Afghan, uh, by the way, uh, Afghan venture by the US. I never understood that. What did they want to achieve from it? it? If it was to install democracy there, well, it wasn't going to happen through the barrel of a gun. If it was to liberate the Afghan women, never in human history has another country come to liberate someone's women. So, I, so if it was just from what, what I could understand, it was to Osama bin Laden was the terrorist. And they thought that Taliban were harboring him. So when the Taliban government was removed, they should have, they should have left because the longer they stayed, the more the resistance started building up because it's in the Afghan nature to resist foreigners. It's, it's their history. So, and yet there was no clear aim. What was, what was victory going to be in Afghanistan? So um, uh, uh, to answer your question in the end, I didn't think Joe Biden had much option left. I mean, they had to withdraw from Afghanistan sometime or the other. The only problem was the way the withdrawal took place. Now, I again don't blame Joe Biden because he wasn't supposed to know that Ashraf Ghani would, would take off in the middle of the night. The president would leave the country. And the moment he left the country, the whole Afghan army collapsed. Uh, by the way, Afghan army was already collapsing. So no one was expected to, uh, Biden wasn't expected to know that there were 300,000 Afghan army would just collapse and that the president would take off. Because all of us, he, we sitting in Pakistan thought there would be a civil war. There would be, you know, 300,000 Afghan army would, it would take a long time. Uh, I, when I met President Trump, he, I mean, this was, almost two years before, uh, before the, what happened uh, uh, in Kabul. I mean, pre President Trump thought that the government, Afghan government would last six months after the withdrawal, but no one expected that the way it would, it collapsed. And so because it collapsed uh, in the way it did, the whole withdrawal became chaotic and uh, no one was expecting it. And then the airport scenes, and I think uh, President Biden actually got a lot of flag, but, you know, 
uh, if that had happened two years later, for instance, if two years later they had withdrawn, and if the president had fled uh, as, uh, as Ashraf Ghani did, the same thing would have happened two years later. So I think, you know, he couldn't have predicted the collapse of the Afghan army and the president leaving the country.